Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can we have the video, please? <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second plenary session of the conference. Day two today is a perfect follow-up after yesterday's two plenaries, Chris Weil giving us the Global Can data, and Katie Dane with an update on the NCD agenda. Today we're going to focus on improving outcomes through healthcare systems. We have three speakers for you today. All three doins in their fields, who through their work have made efforts at improving the outcomes of our patients. The three presentations cover three different but important aspects in improving patient care outcomes. Women's health, a unique model of the use of technology, and palliative care. Uh, the format today is a little different from what we did yesterday. So yesterday we had two speakers and then we did a panel discussion. Today we're going to have three speakers. There's going to be no panel discussion, but I've taken the permission of the speakers. If we do have time, we will open it up for a Q&A, and they all have graciously agreed to do so. So without much ado, I'd invite our first plenary speaker of today, Kirsty Sward Gusmao from Australia. Kirsty is a breast cancer survivor and the founding director of Alola Foundation, which seeks to improve the lives of ladies in Timor. The foundation motto is strong woman, strong nation, and it has a strong record of enabling girls to complete their secondary schooling as well as contributing to a dramatic reduction in the rates of infant mortality through promotion of exclusive breastfeeding, family planning, and immunization. Kirsty has been, her efforts have been acknowledged, and she's been appointed as an officer of the Order of Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to welcome Kirsty. Sword Gusmao for the first plenary of today. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply grateful for the opportunity that I've been given to speak to you and I thank my friends at the Breast Cancer Network of Australia for the part that they played in making it possible for me to be here with you at this important gathering. I am an Australian by birth, but my adopted second homeland is Timor-Leste, one of the youngest and poorest countries in the world. I had the privilege of being Timor-Leste's first First Lady in the challenging years following the country's declaration of independence from Indonesia in 2002. There were so many important issues and challenges um, facing the country 
over those years, given the mammoth task of rebuilding a nation and a people shattered both physically and mentally by decades of war and centuries of colonial rule. I chose to focus my attention on women and their special needs, needs often neglected in a patriarchal society like Timor-Leste's. I established a women's organisation called the Alola Foundation, an organisation which has done amazing things to improve the health, educational opportunities and livelihoods of Timor-Leste's women for the past 17 years. I could talk to you for hours about the amazing women of Alola, but I'm conscious that I have a very short amount of time to share with you today. And so let me jump to the bit of my story that concerns cancer. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer in December 2012, I was lucky to find myself in the country of my birth. I was lucky too to have expert care, top-notch treatment facilities, and the comfort of knowing that some of the top brains in the field were guiding me to good health. With a wig on my head and a grateful heart, I returned to Timor-Leste some eight months later. I'd never really given much thought to the incidence of breast cancer and treatment options in Timor-Leste, even though my Alola Foundation is the number one partner of government in promoting exclusive breastfeeding across the country. When I did start digging around for information amongst my colleagues in the Ministry of Health and within Alola itself, a fairly grim picture emerged. The majority of breast cancer patients present with locally advanced and or metastatic disease. The mortality of those treated at Dili National Hospi Hospital is estimated to be at least 50%, with more than 80% mortality overall. I was shocked to learn that by comparison, the mortality rate from breast cancer in Australia is close to 10%, certainly a stark contrast. Together with a diminutive but feisty Catholic nun called Sister Lita, who had been diagnosed with breast cancer at around about the same time as me, I decided to form a women's cancer support group aimed at raising awareness of the importance of early detection. Many people that we spoke to questioned whether there was any value in forming such a group when there are very limited cancer services in country, including an absence of histopathology, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. Why educate rural women about the importance of early detection and how to do a breast self-examination when only the rich will be able to afford to seek treatment abroad, people asked. Well, if my experience of working with East Timorese women through Alola's programs has taught me anything, it was that all social change begins with education and an investment in women, no matter what the cause, is bound to yield returns. In spite of some improvements since independence, Timor-Leste has one of the highest rates of infant and maternal mortality in the region. Alola's maternal and child health program has harnessed the clever, intuitive and community-minded women and girls of Timor-Leste to establish mother support groups comprising volunteers at the village level to educate women and their families about the importance of exclusive breastfeeding, immunisation, family planning, safe motherhood good infant nutrition, etc. As a direct result of Alola's campaigns in collaboration with the Ministry of Health to promote exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life, rates of exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life have risen dramatically from around 30% in 2005 to over 50% in 2015. This work, in tandem with awareness raising around good infant nutrition feeding practices, contributed to Timor-Leste achieving Millennium Development Goal number four, relating to a reduction in rates of under five mortality. In 2016, Haliku was officially adopted by the Maternal and ha Child Health Program of Alola. And so nowadays, as well as talking about um, talking to women about the life-saving power of exclusive breastfeeding, our trainers share information about how early detection of a tumour can similarly save lives. And here I would like to introduce um, the manager of the uh, Alola Maternal and Child Health Program, Maria Guterres, Manamaku. <laughs> 
I'm so thrilled that uh, with the support um, of local organisations here in Malaysia, Maria was able to accompany me here uh, to Kuala Lumpur to this very special event. Since 2016, 80 women's cancer prevention workshops have been conducted for community health volunteers, government and private institutions, female soldiers, Catholic nuns and school students. Awareness raising campaigns have been conducted in 59 villages and exhibitions held at government institutions in 11 municipalities. The program has reached 8,500 people and has supported and referred 88 patients for treatment. Deeply entrenched gender inequalities have a significant impact on a woman's overall health status and her health seeking behaviour. Even when services are available, women's low status may continue to undermine their access to care. The women of Timor-Leste, particularly those in rural or remote communities, are often discouraged by their male partners to seek medical attention for health problems relating to private parts of their anatomy. They'll often have recourse to a traditional healer and traditional medicine administered at home. Only 20% of all babies are delivered in a health institution, with most women opting to give birth at home, sometimes due to pressures from a husband or a mother-in-law. Only 30% of births are attended by a skilled provider, and only 32% of new mothers and babies receive any postnatal care. In a country where over 40% of the population live below the poverty line, sometimes the cost of public transportation to get to a medical centre is prohibitive. Even more daunting for families is the high cost, sometimes as much as several hundred dollars, of arranging for the return of a body following the death of a patient. Women may therefore be reluctant to go to hospital for fear that they will die there and burden their family with the cost of transporting a body home. Continued growth of the Timor-Leste economy, including a reduction in high rates of unemployment, will assist with addressing the economic barriers to women's access to health care. Nevertheless, the societal barriers related to women's status in the community are of course a longer term project and one which will require commitment and investment across all sectors. Cigarettes and cigarette smoke are everywhere in Timor-Leste, in homes, on the streets, in roadside stalls and in schools. The country has one of the highest rates of tobacco consumption in the world, with over 70% of Timorese men using tobacco. One of these men was my former husband and first president of an independent Timor-Leste, Shanana Guzman. In spite of my remonstrations, my children grew up surrounded by cigarette smoke, and they're not alone. According to the Global Youth Tobacco Survey of 2013, 66% of young people are exposed to tobacco smoke at home. Most cigarettes are imported from Indonesia, which also has a very high smoking rate in the population. In June 2016, the government of Timor-Leste approved a new law aimed at tackling the problem of tobacco consumption in the country. A national anti-tobacco campaign, including radio and television commercials, has been ro rolled out to convey accurate information about the impact of smoking. In May, an executive order was issued to all government ministries banning smoking in public places, including public transportation. A short time later, the chair of the Civil Service Commission reinforced the prohibition of smoking in all public administration working environments. This new law is a very important step in the right direction if Timor-Leste is to achieve the targets set forth in its own NCD action plan, as well as the SDGs relating to premature mortality and strengthening the impl implementation of the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Nevertheless, Without the education and empowerment of women and men, and in isolation from the social change that's required to amplify the voices of wives, mother and children, most often the unwitting victims of the tobacco addiction of their husbands, fathers, brothers and sons, this law will bring about change only very slowly. Household air pollution due to solid, full, solid fuel combustion is an important risk factor for chronic respiratory diseases. 
During a recent visit to Baokao Referral Hospital in Timor's second largest city, I was told by the doctors there that the majority of the children in the paediatric ward were suffering from respiratory infections. Only a small fraction of households use clean energy such as electricity. Not unsurprisingly, the 2007 Timor-Leste Living Standards Survey noted a direct correlation between education standards, wealth and place of residence in use of clean and dirty energy sources, with wealthy, well-educated urban families being less likely to use firewood or kerosene as a fuel source. Most Timorese glowed with pride when Burger King opened its first restaurant in Dili in 2013. It was closely followed by a branch of Gloria Jeans and a whole host of other fast food chain restaurants originating from Indonesia. For the growing middle class in Timor-Leste, these are symbols of progress and modernity. In line with improved economic prosperity, rates of obesity amongst males more than doubled between 2006 and 2018. The Government of Timor-Leste's NCD Action Plan 2014 to 2018 acknowledges the importance of adoption of policies that limit saturated fatty acids and the marketing of foods and non-alcoholic beverages high in saturated fats, trans fatty acids, sat, fats, sat, uh, sugar and salt. The Action Plan stipulates targets for 12 indicators including a reduction by 15% of the prevalence of tobacco use by adolescents by 2020. It also acknowledges that there is a lack of baseline data on most of, most of the indicators and that national efforts for prevention and control of NCDs are still quite young. It also references the fact that there is currently inadequate capacity in the country to implement the action plan fully, despite a strong political commitment. In light of the government's limited human and financial resources to tackle the growing burden of NCDs, partnerships are vital. In addition to the large multilateral and bilateral partners, there is a role for smaller, high-impact collaborations, such as those established with Haliku and my Alola Foundation. The Timor-Leste National Breast Cancer Control um, Project was established in 2017 and it's a joining of forces of the Royal Australian College of Surgeons, the Alola Foundation, the Ministry of Health, and the donor, the Annie Millicent Child Care Foundation, um, with technical support um, and other practical support provided by the Breast Cancer Network of Australia. Its aims are to boost health professional and community education, improve diagnostic and treatment facilities at the National Hospital, and develop a palliative care service. Um, and we've been very excited to make contact with um, a number of local Malaysian organisations and also Indonesian organisations, the Yayasan Kanker Indonesia, um, who are prepared to work with us on providing training to our, to our nurses and um, hel helping us set up um, an, a new palliative care service, which has not been in existence to date. There is no systematic cancer reporting in the country However, manual records indicate that breast cancer represents about 10% of the general surgery workload. In a small but important effort to assist the National Hospital to document and report on breast cancer cases, I and my Haliku colleagues recently gifted a laptop to Dr. Alito Suarez, the Director of Surgery at the National Hospital and Chair of the Timor-Leste National Breast Cancer um, Control Program. Another recent initiative has been the establishment of a weekly breast clinic at which Haliku staff are available to offer practical support to patients and to gather data. Supports to patients include assistance with covering the costs of transportation to and from Dili for consultations and the fees of around $200 charged by the laboratory in Indonesia which tests the biopsy samples taken at Dili National Hospital. I'm very proud of this robust partnership, which is truly bearing fruit. Since Haliku's establishment in 2014, numbers of cases of breast and other women's cancers being treated at Dili National Hospital have doubled. 
As the only public awareness and early detection program in the country, Haliku and Alola's uh, breast cancer care work play a vital role in improving breast cancer mortality rates within Timor-Leste. Its current annual budget is just US $30,000, which to date has been contributed from local private sector partners. By running a study tour to Timor-Leste back in August, I was able to rustle up sufficient funds to keep Haliku's work going through to the end of this year. But who knows what 2019 will, will bring. Um, Marco and I were interested to uh, attend um, a Track 5 presentation on raising funds and attracting resources from government this morning and we hope to be able to attend um, more this afternoon. Um, and of course, if any of you have any specific advice and recommendations, we would love to hear from you. Dili National Hospital has not had supplies of tox tamoxifen for close to two years now due to resource limitations and overly complex procurement processes. We don't even have the histopathology facilities and services in order to determine whether tamoxifen is the most appropriate drug to prescribe to patients. So the situation is quite dire, as you can imagine. The profile of the average woman presenting for cancer treatment in Timor-Leste is relatively young, of productive and childbearing age, a reality which only magnifies the importance of Haliku's work. My adopted homeland of Timor-Leste has lost close to a quarter of its population due to war and conflict over 24 years. It hurts my heart to see women and their families continue to suffer unnecessarily in a time of peace and independence. Community awareness, health professional education, prompt referral, along with developing the diagnostic and treatment facilities at a national level are the foundations for improving breast cancer outcomes in Timor-Leste. Palliative care, as I mentioned, still very much in its infancy in our country, is also vitally important. Investing in the training of women surgeons and medical specialists would also help women patients to feel comfortable presenting with suspected breast or other tumours. Whilst it's important to mitigate the supply side fail failures that contribute to breast cancer and NCD mortality and morbidity, it's also crucial that we give due consideration to the combination of social and economic factors in the wider environment that drive gender inequality in health. In addition to women's practical needs, including access to medical services and good nutrition, their strategic needs must also be addressed. These include education, livelihoods, incomes, participation in politics at all levels, assistance with childcare, freedom from violence, and the right to control their own fertility. This is a long-term process requiring action. I had written the word commitment, but after attending the Leaders Summit um, earlier this week, I changed that to action, because that's really what we need, and investment from the pol political leadership of the country, civil society organisations and international partners. Timor Leste will fail to achieve the SDGs relating to non-communicable disease control. However, having the opportunity to engage with you all, to learn from you at this important international forum fills me with hope. And I know that with very clever and committed women like Maria leading the charge, the future of women's health in Timor-Leste looks bright. Obrigado, Barak. Terima kasi. Thank you, Kirsty. Congratulations on your work, action as you call it, and the best as you continue your efforts in East Timor. I'm sure stories like hers will inspire many of us to work towards similar success stories in our own environment. I'd now invite our next plenary speaker, uh, Professor Sanjeev Arora. Sanjeev is the founder director of ECO, ECO standing for Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes. 
He's a distinguished professor of medicine with a tenure in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. Project PICO is a novel concept that uses technology. It's different from telemedicine. Your experts mentor primary care clinicians to help them manage their patient cases and share their expertise via mentoring, guidance, feedback, and didactic education. Sanjeev in his talk will explore the applicability of ECO to cancer control and how the initiative could contribute to achieving university health coverage. Let's join in welcoming Sanjeev to deliver his plenary. You know, first of all, I want to share with you what an honor it is for me to be here today. I want to thank the leadership committee of UICC that uh, invited me, and special thanks to Lisa Stevens from NCI that made this happen. And it's actually my first conference, and I'm just amazed to see this amazing group of people all dedicating themselves to reduce disparity, which is our goal at ECHO. At ECHO, our mission is to democratize medical knowledge and get best practice care to underserved people all over the world. Our goal is to touch the lives of one billion people by the year 2025. The key strategy ECHO uses to help a billion people is to move knowledge instead of moving patients and providers. The story of ECHO starts with a disease, one disease. I'm a gastroenterologist by profession and I'm a specialist in treating hepatitis C. Hepatitis C affects 70 million people worldwide. It's a curable infection, but without treatment, 28% of people who have it will die from it, either from liver cancer or liver failure. Despite the fact that we can cure the vast majority of patients, less than five million have been treated, and as of today, more new patients get hepatitis C than are cured, and we expect 20 million people will die unless we get our act together and get treatment to the others. So I live in Southwest United States, in New Mexico, and 28,000 patients had been diagnosed to have hepatitis C there. And less than 5% of these people had been treated in 2004. There were also 2,300 prisoners who had been diagnosed. And I was the only, what is called a super specialist in hepatitis C in this state, the only one who was running a dedicated clinic in this state of two million people. The good news was it was curable. But the bad news was I had to give them weekly injections and pills, and I had to treat them for a year. And this was difficult because people had to make 12 to 18 trips to come and see me. There were patients who were driving 250 miles each way, coming 12 times for one course of treatment. And with an eight-month wait to see me, poor people had no chance to get treatment. They didn't have the money to travel, and they would have to wait eight months. So I developed ECHO to try and solve this problem. What happened was around 2004, there was a 43-year-old woman. She was a single parent. Her husband had died in a car crash and she had two children. One was a boy who was 14 years old, a girl who was nine. And she came to me, she'd been waiting a long time, she didn't have the money to travel, she couldn't take time off work, and when I saw her, she had end-stage liver cancer. And she died a few months later, leaving these two children as orphans. And I was struggling with the idea that I was living in the richest country in the world, and yet, this woman had died. And every week, every two weeks, I would see new women, new men, dying of 
a curable liver disease with end-stage liver cancer or liver failure. So this was the challenge, and ECHO was born to address this challenge. We said, we are going to develop the capacity to safely and effectively treat hepatitis C everywhere in New Mexico and, it, and to monitor outcomes. And we knew if we could do that and give chemotherapy in a rural area or a prison system, then we would have a model to treat complex disease in rural locations in developing countries. So what is ECHO? ECHO is based on four key principles. They're like four legs of a chair. All must be in place for the chair to be stable. The first is we said we would use technology to leverage scarce resources. What technology? It was one to many video conferencing. The second key idea was based on the work of Edward Deming. We, should, we said we would share best practices. So I had a, at the university, I had this guideline for treating hepatitis C. And what I did is I went around the state and talked to people, and we created 21 centers of excellence for treating hepatitis C. Five of them were in the prison, and 16 were in rural clinics. But in order to be called a center of excellence, you had to have a general practitioner who was willing to take responsibility to be the head of that center of excellence. So I gave them my protocol, and guess what? Not a single one of them was willing to give chemotherapy in a rural area because I had shared my protocol with them. After all, there are lots of lawyers in America. <laughs> so I asked myself, how did I become an expert in treating hepatitis C? I was not born that way. Um, you know, when I did my fellowship in Boston, Massachusetts, from the first week, they would put me in a patient's room. I would see a patient come out and present to my professor, see another patient present to the professor, another one present to the professor, and after two years, they started calling me a gastroenterologist. I said, aha, I'm going to use this model to create new hepatitis C-ologists in New Mexico. We call that case-based learning, and that we would use a web-based database to monitor outcomes. So what do we actually do? Starting in 2003, 2004, we started training these physician assistants in hepatitis C, and then we trained them to use our web-based software to manage these echo clinics, in, on a Wednesday afternoon in 2003, I started the first tele-echo clinic, always on Wednesday from 3 to 5, and I've been doing it for 15 years. We call these knowledge networks, and this is what one looks like. So all 21 of these sites would join me on an interactive video network on Wednesday at 3, and this clinic would go for two hours. For the first one hour and 45 minutes, each one of them would get a chance to present a patient to our team. In the big box is a psychiatrist, a liver specialist, and a pharmacist. On the top right is Deb Newman from Espanola, and she's presenting a patient of hepatitis C to me. I need about 20 pieces of information. She gives me all 20 in about five minutes, and then we all discuss the case. We ask our other rural partners if they have ideas. Then we go to the bottom left. That's the Department of Health in Las Cruces. So overall, 10 de-identified patients and then a 15-minute lecture. That's a standard tele-echo clinic that we started doing. What we found was that within a year of doing this, these 21 general practitioners became experts in hepatitis C through a process called the learning loop. They learned from our lectures. They learned from our advice. They learned from each other because they would bring one patient to the network. They learned on 10 every week. They actually learned on 300 in a year. And they learned on longitudinal management of these patients. And they were becoming experts. But mostly, they learned by doing. I'm going to ask you a question now. We'll see who's paying attention. How many of you have taught your son or daughter to drive a car? Can you raise your hand if you ever did that? Lots of you. So if I asked you this question, you can give your daughter lectures on how to drive a car and then give her a written test, would you give her the keys to the car? <laughs> but you know, this is what we do when new information comes out in medicine. We give doctors lectures, and we hope that they'll apply them. It's a little bit more complicated than just getting a lecture and then applying it on a patient. So these people became experts. 
we call it learning by doing, and then we collect data. Why would a rural clinician join? We give them no-cost CME credits. We reduce professional isolation by bringing a mix of work and learning into their environment and give them access to multiple specialists. I'm often asked this question, so what's the difference between echo and telemedicine? At the bottom of this slide is traditional telemedicine. A specialist in black is helping a patient in blue, and this patient could be 3,000 miles away and the patient can be helped. The issue is that if the specialist is helping one patient on a camera, he's seeing one less patient in Mumbai. And so overall, what happens is, even though the patient benefits greatly, the total number of patients seen in a week, in a year, is not different. And the problem isn't just a geographic mislocation of specialists. The problem is an absolute shortage of specialists in the world, all over the world. Whereas ECHO is not one specialist. It's a team of experts helping teams of individuals who then go and help hundreds and then thousands of patients. That's the goal of ECHO. So what does a rural doctor need? They need a webcam. Everything else below the webcam we provide from ECHO Institute at the University of New Mexico, all over the world. We provide the worldwide platform for video conferencing, video recording system, so these clinics are recorded. We have a repository in the cloud of intellectual property from all over the world for 70 different disease areas where people uh, put their curricula, case presentation templates, PowerPoint presentations, and we have a clinical management tool, et cetera. So we've done 600 such clinics, treated 6,000 patients, provided almost 80,000 hours of CME credit. The first thing we wanted to know was, did these doctors have self-efficacy? We knew that no doctor could give chemotherapy without self-efficacy, just like you wouldn't allow your daughter to drive a car without guided practice. So we took 25 of these clinicians. Scale is one, I have no skill. Seven, I'm an expert who can teach others. And in one year, the ability to treat liver disease, 3.2 to 5.5. To treat HCV, 2 to 5.2 out of seven. Fifth question, can you serve as a local consultant within your clinic, 2.4 to 5.6? So what we started seeing was a very interesting phenomenon started emerging. First, these doctors treated their own clinic patients, but then everybody in the town with hepatitis C went to them. And the wait in my clinic in 18 months fell to two weeks. Now, 15 years later, the wait in my clinic is still only two weeks. Overall competence went from 2.8 to 5.5. We knew patients were benefiting because cure rates were high, access was good. We wanted to know, do doctors benefit? In this study, 97, 94, and 98% felt achieving competence was beneficial to them. Has it diminished your professional isolation? 4.3 out of 5. Enhanced my professional satisfaction? 4.8. Benefit to my clinic? 4.9. Expands access to H HCV treatment? 4.9 out of 5. The next question was very perplexing to me because it had nothing to do with hepatitis C. I was asking these rural doctors in America, is access to a specialist in general a major area of need for you? 4.9 out of 5. The reason it was perplexing is we have more specialists in the United States than any other country in the world. We have 50 times more than Africa, and yet our rural doctors can't access specialists. So we have hypothesized that six billion people in the world don't have access to the right knowledge at the right place at the right time. And if you don't have the right knowledge at the right place at the right time, you cannot get the right care at the right place at the right time. Even, you remember that 43-year-old single mom who saw me, she was living in America. All the medicines were available. She didn't have to pay a cent for them. But if the knowledge didn't exist where she lived, care was impossible to get. So of course, it's not good enough that doctors have a really good time, right? The question is, can they do as good a job as super specialists? So we studied that in a head-to-head -head study which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. 
outcomes of treatment of hepatitis C by primary care providers. At the time this study was published, literally in no other state than New Mexico, primary care doctors were treating hepatitis C. So objectives were to train primary care clinicians in rural areas and prisons to show that such care is as safe and effective as a university. We can improve care for minorities. We took these 21 intervention clinics, 16 rural clinics, five prisons, control was university clinic. Principal endpoint was a cure of the virus, lifelong and permanent cure. These are the results. 68% of the echo patients getting chemo were minorities, 49% of the university. Genotype one cure rate, 50, 46, 70, 71 for genotype two and three. Uh, we concluded that rural primary care clinicians deliver hepatitis C care under the aegis of ECHO that is as safe and effective as a university clinic and that we can improve access to care for minorities. What was really surprising about this study, and it applies to cancer, because I'm going to get to cancer in a minute, is that this cure rate was higher. These rural doctors were getting higher cure rates than solo specialists in the United States. Because when patients have to travel long distances, cure rates are lower. We then described six criteria. We said if the disease was common, management was complex, new treatments coming, high societal impact, serious outcomes of untreated disease, and if you have effective treatments, you could use this model. We used the Pareto's principle called the 80-20 rule. That is, you don't need to do echo for 200 diseases. You do it for the top 20, 30 diseases in your country and produce the same level of care at a community health center as a university. That will have a transformative influence. The goal of ECHO is a force multiplication. This is a US Department of Defense term. We have defined it in healthcare as an exponential improvement in capacity to deliver best practice care 10 times, 100 times. That's the kind of capacity expansion you need if you want to reduce disparities. Now, we do ECHO in 33 countries, 239 hubs like the University of New Mexico do it. For a variety of diseases, many of them cancers, cardiology, chronic pain, endocrinology, HIV, and so on and so forth. We published in Health Affairs, and we wanted to know, does, was it only working for hepatitis C, or does it work for other things too? And you can see here, fifth question, I'm developing my clinical expertise, 4.48 out of five. Fourth question, I apply what I've learned to all my patients with similar chronic diseases, 4.45 out of five. This is a study by the Veterans Administration, a group of 150 hospitals in the United States taking care of 10 million veterans, where they applied ECHO and showed that doctors who participated in ECHO and took care of serious liver disease, mortality for liver disease was 46% lower than if they didn't participate in ECHO. We have 129 peer-reviewed publications now from a sh showing that the provider learning increases, there is improved quality of care, improved access to care, workforce issues, improved, reduced cost, better access, et cetera. We've been able to show that ECHO can demonstrate participation, can demonstrate satisfaction of providers. We have demonstrated in 31 studies that providers learn in 22 studies, we have shown that provider competence goes up. In 20 studies, we've been able to show that if you look at their medical record and see if performance changed, performance changes. In seven studies, patient outcomes improve. And now there are two papers in publication showing that community health improves with ECHO. One out of the state of Punjab, which basically, there's an institute called PGI Chandigarh there, which was treating 1,200 hepatitis C patients every year. And the we partnered with the government, and they treated 50,000 patients in 18 months in all the district hospitals um, with a 93% cure rate. Another area where community health improvement has been shown is the country of Georgia, where we partnered with the US government for eliminating hepatitis C. Exactly the same thing. Now we have treated about 45,000 patients there by decentralization of care. In order to get good care to underserve people in the world, it is essential to decentralize. The idea of specialists holding monopolies lead to tens of millions of deaths every year. This is a map of New Mexico, Albuquerque, our hepatitis C program. 
These are the 400 points of contact we have for 39 different disease areas in New Mexico. This is the VA ECHO project, 11 academic hubs, 600 clinics for 300 disease, 39 disease areas. This is US Department of Defense ECHO with hubs in Belgium, Germany, Italy, Japan, South Korea. So remember in the first slide I said we wanted to help a billion people. We could not do that ourselves. So we said we would teach other universities to do ECHO. 136 of the leading universities in the United States do ECHO now. Harvard, Johns Hopkins, Yale, University of Chicago, MD Anderson, Texas, UCSF, University of Washington, and many others. Worldwide, we are in 33 countries, Australia, Vietnam, Myanmar, India, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, 10 African countries, many Latin American countries, Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, Ecuador, Venezuela, Mexico, and others. This is our work in Africa to control HIV. This is Namibia. 120,000 patients have HIV, 60,000 are on treatment, and these are all district hospitals getting trained to do HIV. Vietnam, multidrug resistant TB. India, multidrug resistant TB. So what are the potential benefits of ECHO? Improved quality safety, rapid learning, best practice dissemination, reducing variation, improving access for underserved patients, workforce training and force multiplier effects, improving professional satisfaction, cost effective care, preventing cost of untreated disease, integrating public health. But the frame shift super specialists like me in the world have to make is that we cannot monopolize our knowledge for private gain. We have to democratize it for the good of humanity if we're gonna change the world. In the field of cancer, this is a big problem. Big data, artificial intelligence, human genome sequencing, proteomics, computer-aided drug design. This is causing an explosion of knowledge in the cancer field. Breast cancer mortality rates in the United States of African-American women were the same in 1979 as whites, the same. Now, African-American women die 43% more likely to die of breast cancer in the United States. That, if that is progress, I don't want it. I would rather have a more equitable progress where we don't leave half the world behind when we make all this amazing progress. But the challenge is medical knowledge is increasing exponentially. More knowledge will be created in the next 30 years than all of human history. So the challenge is how will we democratize this? Our current models of knowledge distribution are linear. And you can see the result of this. These are two papers from CDC showing that rural mortality rates are much higher and rapidly the gap between urban and rural areas in the US keeps expanding instead of uh, narrowing. We heard the first day of this conference, 18 million new patients of cancer worldwide this year. I can guarantee you that 75% of them will not get best practice care. That's a challenge. That's a challenge for all of us at Humanity to how will we solve this problem. So what do we do for cancer? We have echo projects in prevention area for smoking cessation, HPV, hepatitis B, sun safety, in screening for skin cancer, breast, cervical, oral, lung, pathology best practice, treatment, hepatitis B and C treatment, pain, toxicity management, tumor boards, cancer care navigation, precision medicine, palliative care, survivorship. We have 65 academic university hubs, seven countries. No, 24 hubs, 65 programs in seven countries. This is University of Texas, MD Anderson, doing ECHO, 11 active programs um, led by this team shown here, Ernie Hawk, Kathleen Schmeller, Shubra Ghosh from there, and uh, Louis Foxhall are here at this meeting. This is American Cancer Society ECHO. Richard Vendor is here from there, our partner. Uh, they have many plans for ECHO projects, um, but right now they do lung cancer patient support. They're starting tobacco cessation, HPV screening. This is Kimberly Hospital Complex ECHO, and this team is here um, for this conference. And this is the Northern Cape where there's tremendous disparities in South Africa and lung cancer and mesothelioma echo. This is our partnership with the National Cancer Institute in the US where they, start, where they have three major programs. 
One is in the APEC region, Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, with China, Malaysia, and all these countries. Africa, ECHO, they have a separate ECHO for Africa, and the countries shown here, you can see. And they have a third Caribbean ECHO in the countries listed here. This is ECHO out of National Institute of Cancer Prevention and Research in India, where they are doing now many ECHO projects oral cancer screening, tobacco cessation. They have trained community health workers in breast, cervical cancer screening, oral cancer screening. This is our next speaker, Dr. Raj Gopal, on the left side of this slide. And he runs a ECHO project and has participants from, mostly from India, but also across Southeast Asia. Tata Memorial Hospital runs an ECHO project for treatment of cancer, virtual tumor board. And I'll show you that we have lots of projects. I'm just going to scan this. You can look at this list so that if there's one in your area that you want to join. These are the MD Anderson projects. This is, so let me say, let me end by telling you about the ECHO Act. The ECHO Act was passed in the United States Senate 97-0 and passed the House and was signed by President Obama into law. It's a bipartisan effort with 17 co-sponsors from Democrats and Republicans, unanimous approval. This is our ECHO team. This is my last slide. So what makes ECHO work? First, team-based care. Task shifting is the idea of every human being working at the highest level of his human potential. In our view, this requires three things. Interprofessional consultation, many experts helping. Guided practice, teaching your daughter to drive a car and a mentor-mentee relationship. ECHO is not just a knowledge network. It's a social network. What produces values, respect, and relationships, and guidance, and empathy, and kindness, and other human values. All teach, all learn is the idea that ECHO is not a unidirectional flow of information. In fact, the experts learn. ECHO deals with three kinds of knowledge. The guideline, but that's also available in Google. Second, how to apply that guideline to an individual patient. That requires collaboration. But third, what systems do you need? How do you implement this guideline? You can have a colorectal cancer screening guideline or a breast cancer. Its implementation in Kenya is different from the US, is different from India. And that new knowledge of process implementation knowledge, you need four things to change a system. You need knowledge. You need to apply it. You need human resources that are trained. And lastly, you need the systems. And ECHO supports that. I want to thank our supporters. Our work in cancer is supported by Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation and in India by Merck Foundation and Africa and US by BMS Foundation. And please join us in our movement to help a billion people. And I have my, left my email address in case you need to reach out so we can provide your support to start ECHO projects. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sanjeev. I think perfectly executioned the project. He felt a need, thought of a solution, then put the science to it, and a New England Journal publication Congratulations, and then he exported it to 70 uh, different countries, no, 33 countries, 70 diseases, and over 200 hubs. So congratulations, Sanjeev, and thanks for your efforts even bringing it back into India. I think what, uh, again, uh, was a learning for me is that most of us think disparity is to do with low and middle income countries, and here in one of the most developed countries, you saw this disparity worked on it, and then took it to the rest of the world. So congratulations. I'm sure you'll be inundated with people who will ask you for help in their own countries. We now come to the final plenary of the day. Uh, this is on palliative care. And I'd like to introduce our very own Dr. Raja Gopal. He's a renowned palliative care physician and the founder and chairman of Pallium. That's a palliative, non-governmental organization based in Kerala. In 2014, Dr. Raja Gopal was honored by Human Rights Watch with the Alison Desfoss Award for Extraordinary Activism 
in recognition of his tireless efforts to defend the right of patients to live and die with dignity. A little bird told me outside that Dr. Raja Gopal has been nominated this time for the Nobel Peace. So I just wish him great luck if that dream uh, works out. And there will be a little video on Dr. Raja Gopal tomorrow in this very hall at about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. It's called Hippocritic, 18 Experiments in Gently Shaping the World. Now, this plenary is going to be a, a little different. Dr. Raja Gopal just sent me a little message, and I'm going to quote. He says, I'm sorry that I have a bad throat today and I've completely lo lost my voice. My apologies. My dear friend Jyotsna Govil, who heads the Indian Cancer Society in Delhi, a cancer activist, has agreed to loan me her voice. So Dr. Raja Gopal and Jyotsna, please come on the stage. A round of welcome. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a privilege for me to lend my voice, as Anil says, to Dr. Rajagopal. All I'm doing is reading his words. And since I didn't have too much time to prepare, I hope you'll forgive me if I fumble. The first, this is a message from Dr. Rajagopal. Good morning to you, and thank you for the privilege of addressing you. I apologize for my voice, which I seem to have lost in the early morning hours today. And the note to me is, thank you for stepping in. This ad appeared in a South American newspaper. I'm sorry to report that the person died in pain as morphine did not reach her in time. She is not alone. In India, more than 26,000 people commit suicide from health-related suffering. For every person who succeeds, how many dozens would be trying and failing? And for every one of them, how many dozens would be wishing that they had the courage to do it? We live in a strange world where 18% of the world's population consumes 83% of the world's medical opioids. The misery of pain in the rest of the world is beyond the average human being's imagination. There seem to be two kinds of suffering the so-called opioid crisis in America, as against the crisis of untreated pain in 83% of the world. Western European countries seem to have been good at overcoming both extremes in achieving balance so that most of the needy have access to pain relief at the same time, avoiding non-medical prescription op opioids. But compared to the UK, the global average of consumption is about 1 40th. And in many countries like India, it is less than 1 200th of the UK uptake. My own state of uh, Kerala is better than most of the rest of the country. And yet, only one out of 140 of what we might call good in the UK. The result is that the poor live and die in agonizing pain. This man with lung cancer and bony metastasis has spent most of the three weeks in this position. It took less than one hour 
and about five cents worth. Is that me or you? <laughs> uh, he spent most of three weeks in that position, but it took less than one hour and about five cents of American money to enable him to sit up and enjoy a cup of tea for the first time in three weeks. There is an added cruelty to what awaits him unless palliative care reaches him. Anyone who has money at all dies in intensive care units. They get no pain relief, but they have a tube in every orifice and are isolated from family members and die cruel kinds of death. As the British oncologist, Dr. Sankha Mitra has said about the situation in India, the poor die in misery and in neglect, the middle class die in the misery of ignorance, and the rich die in the misery on ventilators. No one gets a pain-free or a dignified death. The lack of palliative care often leads to inappropriate, aggressive treatment in most of the developing world. The cost of treatment are out of pocket for the patient and the family. Families get wiped out financially. Every year, a growing number of people are pushed below poverty line by the catastrophic health expenditure. Data from the World Bank points to more than 808 million people worldwide who are subjected to catastrophic health expenditure. More than 55 million people in India go below the poverty line in every year due to out-of-pocket health expenses. Such a denial of pain relief is clearly a violation of human rights. As the United States, United Nations Special Rapporteur for Torture points out, the de facto denial of access to pain relief, if it causes severe pain and suffering, constitutes cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. So I re reiterate that pain relief or palliative care should not be viewed as an optional extra or as a charity, but should be considered a human right. In the context of cultural, social, and economic realities in low and low middle income countries, how do we make this happen? Our own answer from Kerala in India is to engage the community and to make them partners in palliative care delivery, thus recruiting a large workforce at no cost. To explain what we do in India, let me bring up the concept of social capital. This woman and her children and the growing number of nuclear families in the developing world form the micro element of social capital. The healthcare establishments, which are growing at a very fast pace, form the macro element. The healthcare establishments, uh, sorry, please note that the current social transformation, the micro element is becoming more and more microscopic and the macro element is growing more and more macroscopic, the corporate healthcare world. The woman and her children are effectively disconnected from the growing healthcare of patients. To fill the gap, we facilitate the growth of the MISO element of social capital, making use of the essential goodness of the community. There would be no part of the world which does not have compassionate people who get some pleasure out of helping others. We recruit them as volunteers, and they act as a bridge between the family and health system. Volunteers are often able to give the true health care, physical, social, mental, and spiritual well-being. Let me expand the picture to explain it further. 
This picture on the left, I guess, was taken on World Palliative Care Day. Every year on the second Saturday in October, we offer an outing for our patients who are not ambulant. A significant number of them would be paraplegics. On this day, there were about 40 patients who could not walk. We had to get them out of houses which were typically not barrier free. They had to be physically carried to the road, put on a wheelchair and brought to the venue. Each of them required four able-bodied men to help. We had no problem finding them. 160 students from two engineering colleges came forward on that Saturday, four going to each patient's home. So what did that achieve? That can be illustrated in what the young woman in red and green who does not have normal sensation in her lower limbs said. Now where is this girl? There she is. Uh -uh. The waves touching my feet was the best experience that I have had in my whole life. Is that not health care? If health is defined as a physical, social, and mental well-being, can we professionals alone aspire to achieve that? Welcoming volunteers from the community as partners in healthcare has changed our state of Kerala. More than 200 non-government organizations are involved in palliative care in their own localities. They find suffering patients, lead us to them, and act as a link between the patient and us. Our home care vehicle acts as a mobile pharmacy. Medicines and consumables are distributed to them, enough to last until the next week, and in the meanwhile, the local volunteer is able to be in touch with the patient and to be supported. We would know if someone is starving, and between us and them, we make sure that such families get the food kit they need every month. If palliative care involves the care of families also, shouldn't the children of those families get any attention? The children often have gray lives. One patient, one patient paralyzed or dead, and the surviving spouse too busy to battle the world to remember to hug or to say I love you. In the face of, in the face of impoverishment, many children would stop going to school. So our volunteers run an education support program. And currently, we have about 300 children in our locality whose education we support, and with the, with the required fees and materials, supplemented by an annual three-day camp every year, where they have some fun, but also receive personal attention to psychosocial needs. About our policy of engaging the community in palliative care, the former editor of the British medical journal, Dr. Richard Smith said, the Kerala model does provide a feasible way of achieving Murray's vision of palliative care, covering all patients, all diseases, all nations, all settings, and all dimensions. It is hard to see how it will be achieved in any other way. We then wonder, why should the engagement of the community be limited only to palliative care? Why not all health care? But in the context of comparatively good health care in the Western world, is the participation of the community relevant? Perhaps you do not need volunteers for much of the needs because professionals are available but I wonder whether professionals are able to make them feel loved enough and to avoid the thought, no one cares for me. And is not loneliness a deadly disease that is growing in the West, particularly among the elderly? Well, I hear that in several parts of Canada and Australia, and perhaps in other Western countries, the compassionate community is emerging. I repeat my statement. 
that community participation could well be relevant to all of healthcare in prevention, in patient navigation, in warding off loneliness, and even in providing companionship for the last days. Whether or not it is available relevant to the global north, I do feel that it is essential for the global south, which, let, let me remind you, forms 80% of the world. Such a transformation of healthcare is not likely to happen spontaneously. It needs categorical action and in terms of ad advocacy and of facilitation. But whose job is it to advocate, to argue for change? Is that the job of health professionals? Well, if we do not, nobody else will. That's it. One more. Sorry. Thank you. One more. <laughs> Sorry about that, uh, Ernie. Let me conclude by pointing out that by keeping quiet, we are not being neutral. The growing destruction of health by an insensitive system is destroying millions of people around the globe. And by being silent, we are becoming silent partners of this evil system. Let me end by quoting Dr. Berwick and pointing out again that being silent means assisting the harm. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jyotsna and Dr. Raja Gopal. You know, except for the last slide, I didn't believe that this was the first time they did it. I thought they've done this dual thing, except the last, you know, it was near perfect, but congratulations on your effort. And Dr. Raja Gopal, if that, I wish you a speedy recovery, but if that Nobel dream comes true and you need a voice, I'll come for the acceptance <laughs> speech. Perfect. Uh, Jyotsna says, I want a job. Jyotsna, if I lose my voice, I'm going to take you. You were awesome. You were just awesome. OK, so we've got, uh, Celine, do we have time? I think three great presentations, three different aspects. East Timor, uh, Sanjeev's uh, technology uh, on the eco model, and palliative care. We've got 10 minutes. It's open for questions, comments, suggestions. We do have uh, Dr. the three. Cruz? Yep. Can I ask a question? KK. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Right at the back. Go ahead. Uh, this question is to Dr. Arora. Uh, have you got any experience in uh, uh, incorporating echo with diseases where surgery is a part of treatment? For example, in India, oral cancer is a big problem, and surgery is a main component. So, uh, have you had any experience in? training surgeons or something like that? I think there are um, some areas in which uh, it is occurring, and uh, a particular area is uh, cervical cancer. Uh, specifically, um, when you have to train in surgery, yeah. uh, there are multiple aspects of a surgical program with echo. The first is diagnosis of the correct patient who needs surgery and effective triage. In the absence of that knowledge, a huge number of people travel from villages to towns and are told you don't need an operation. So that's one. Okay. Second is the idea of correct pre-op clearance occurring before. So, okay, you need surgery, but are you a candidate for surgery? That can occur in the periphery. Third, in terms of procedures, It'll be very difficult to do neurosurgery in a rural area or a small town, but there are general surgeons and there are OBGYN uh, surgeons, etc., who can do uh, moderate or mildly complex operations and a hybrid model in which there is on-site training followed by echo projects um, can be very valuable. Post-operative care 
yeah. post-transplant care, and the entire continuum can be optimized, but it cannot be done purely by video conference. And so we have lots of programs uh, uh, run by MD Anderson, for example, in Texas at, in, um, for cervical cancer, et cetera. So the other place where it's going to be used is something called safe surgery. Okay. That is quality improvement in surgery as opposed to just actual techniques. So thank you for your question. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and it was really wonderful. And um, I think uh, it's one of the most important things we've had here. So many sound bites, but one of the ones that um, I like most was when you said we should not hoard uh, you know, knowledge for our own personal benefits, but we should make it democratized so that people will benefit. What we are doing in Nigeria is a mobile system. We have mobile cancer centers that have 10 functions in them. So they have a, a, the mammogram, a digital mammogram, colonoscopy, uh, a small theater, a side lab. So more or less all the works in one place. And uh, uh, we've had problem with, uh, you know, having to gather all the personnel together to go for these missions. So we're thinking exactly in this direction that we needed to get primary care doctors who would be, who would re-echo <coughs> whatever the um, specialists know by being trained in these uh, several fields. So I already said yesterday that we are going to come to New Mexico and we are going to um, seek to become an eco center in our you know, headquarters in Lagos. But just for the benefit of this plenary, how would you apply the ecosystem to a mobile, uh, uh, you know, a mobile um, program like ours so that as the doctors go around, they can connect back to the hub and get their training as they go. Thank you. Thank you for your question and your comment. I think that for any major intervention to occur, as I said, three or four things have to happen if you really want to make big impact. The first is the actual knowledge must go. The second is th there has to be a human resource that is trained to use that knowledge. Without that, the knowledge alone is pretty sterile. <coughs> and the third is, you have to put a system in place where that person who has that knowledge can actually apply it. That is the macro environment in which work occurs. And as I said in my talk, that's different in each country. In Nigeria, it's different from Ethiopia, it's different from, and so on and so forth. So this all teach, all learn platform allows dialogue to occur to create new solutions and create systems to allow the implementation of a new technology of the kind you're talking about. Otherwise, you know, you can go around the world and see technology lying, CAT scanners and MRI scanners and operating rooms, and they're not being used because people have not thought through this entire sequence of events all of which must be in place for a significant intervention to work. And so ECHO is designed for that problem. Thank you. Yes, sir. Can we have that mic and that aisle, uh, the sound up? Maybe you could just try speaking. I wonder whether we could. Go ahead. Maybe you could ask a question in the meantime. Okay, a, a quick question on the echo. Uh, what are the challenges and uh, the, the downside that you have faced uh, in, uh, uh, in running these programs across many countries? I'm imagining, especially in developing countries, where internet connectivity may not be that great. Maybe you could speak to the challenges and uh, what you've been doing about those challenges. I think the primary challenge is our own thought process. The current model created in the world is monopolization. Monopolization of knowledge is power, it's money, it's fame, it's many things. And, but it also leads to increasing disparities. So we need to shift our framework. That are we going to have a world where we're just going to have a few who will get good care, or are we going to democratize that? And I think that's a philosophical question. And even today, not every specialist wants to democratize his knowledge. But as I've been traveling the world, I can tell you the world is full of specialists 
who have a different problem than the one I described. That was the problem I was having. I'm a super specialist. I'd spent 30 years becoming this super, spe the only super specialist. But the only person I could meet, could help, was someone who can see me personally. That was a very limiting thought. I wanted to have greater human impact. So Echo solved that problem for me. So there's that. And the internet in general is not a major problem for us because of greater 3G and 4G and the video conferencing platforms we use now. Even in Africa, most providers have either a 3G phone or a 4G phone, and they join Echo with that. Um, it's not perfect. We don't get to the last mile of healthcare. For example, that picture of Namibia, we get to the hospitals, rural hospitals or rural clinics where they can come. Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Daniel, and I'm uh, working in South Africa. Um, I would like to thank um, Professor Arora for your uh, innovation in helping reduce uh, disparities and inequities in cancer care, in, especially in Africa. Um, we have um, huge inequities and disparities in cancer care in South Africa. And um, we have adopted this ECHO model to help um, in reducing these disparities in equities in cancer treatment. Um, we are, uh, we, we've collaborated with University of New Mexico. Um, we are able to tune in with MD Anderson Cancer Center. And we, we are also able to um, zoom in with Kenya, with the tumor board, and this is really helping <coughs> us. Um, one main problem that we are experiencing is um, sometimes having to get people um, uh, in the district hospitals to tune in to the uh, echo, tele echo clinic. So what advice will you give us so that we'll be able to make those um, healthcare workers in the peripheral areas to get interested in tuning in to this echo clinic? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your comment. I think that um, in a world where we get paid on a fee-for-service basis for every time we do something, what we value is statistics of productivity. The problem is, in that model, everybody is so busy ringing the bell, it doesn't really matter whether you're creating music or you're creating noise. As long as you ring the bell, the productivity parameter has been met. I think we need to think much differently in the world of healthcare, because the healthcare system today is designed for the needs of providers, doctors, insurance companies, hospitals. We need to reconfigure this system for the needs of patients. When we do that, a patient doesn't want many more visits. The patient wants the right thing to be done the first time around. That requires the right knowledge to be present there, the right support for the doctor, and then naturally, from that mindset flows the idea that for a doctor to spend a little bit of time in training and development is essential for them to provide good care. Because when we provide not good care the first time around, it needs to rework and rework. Lots of patient discomfort. Now this frame shift is not going to be easy, Daniel, because we are you, we are addicted, we are addicted to this model of counting visits and counting this and counting that and not counting the patient's experience and final outcome. And so it's not going to be easy, but partnering with governments, creating forums, conversations, showing the echo models, effectiveness, all of these will be important things. Thank you. We'll have one last question because the speakers are going to be at the meeting cafe at uh, two fifty this afternoon. So a brief comment. And then uh, no, we'll Jim Cleary, University of Wisconsin in Indiana University. Firstly, an apology. Raj spent last weekend at our house and I think got the virus there. Oh, I'm very okay. sorry, Raj. Congratulations to UICC for bringing palliative care stories across the board. And I admire um, UICC's leadership in bringing this forward. UICC, together with 
the UN Office of Drugs and Crime and WHO has a collaboration. And we went to Timor-Leste some three years ago. The consumption of morphine in that country, 41 grams per year. 41 grams, not milligrams. One of the big issues we heard was we need to educate personnel, and this comes to the question, we need to educate not only physicians, but nurses and pharmacists. Is ECHO used to educate nurses around the world as, as well? Because I think that's a critical issue as we move forward with improving access to palliative care. Uh, yes, um, palliative care echoes. We have 10 hubs in the world. And the entire United Kingdom's healthcare system has adopted ECHO with 10 hubs just for the United Kingdom uh, out of hospices, UK hospice being the, um, and what happens is the focus is nurse training. And we, we do agree completely with you. Um, we have ECHO for palliative care in Alaska and Uruguay for pediatric. And in every single palliative care ECHO, it is essential to train nurses in addition to doctors, or if I had a choice between the two, I would train the nurses. <laughs> but ideally, it's important to train teams so that because palliative care is not just a delivery problem. It's a thought problem. It's a thinking problem of thinking in an empathetic way from the patient's perspective instead of the provider perspective. And, and the system needs to be trained to think in that way, and nurses are amazing. Uh, so thank you, uh, the speakers. If you can join me in a round of applause. Uh, they'll again be available at 2.50 in the meeting cafe. Thank you for your attention. We come to the end of this plenary. <laughs>